Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We are in unit one and we are working with a comparing of two literary works. The first one, the uh, Langston Hughes, uh, Marian Anderson piece. Now we're going to turn to Sandra Cisneros' uh, Tipiak. Uh, when, uh, before we get there on page 104, uh, the short story that we'll be studying of Cisneros, let's do two things. One, on your annotations at 2B, let's remind ourselves that we're working with this notion of style, and we're really concentrating in two areas. One, diction. Of course, here we mean word choice, right? The types of words the writer will use to convey certain kinds of understandings. And the other is syntax, that is to say sentence structure, especially as it's related to the way words are organized to express ideas. Okay? Now we're going to pay attention to two things. One, the way Cisneros does this in remarkable ways. We're going to see Cisneros over the course of our four years of high school a number of times. Uh, but, but as well, we want to compare how she does this with uh, Langston Hughes as well. Hey, let's learn a little bit about Cisneros on page 97, born in 1954 to Mexican father and Mexican-American mother. Cisneros spent her childhood shuttling between Chicago and Mexico City. The only girl from seven children. That's huge, as she writes about it in her, in her work. Cisneros felt as if she had seven fathers struggling to find her identity. She took refuge in reading and writing. She won many writing honors. Although her family was not well off, Cisneros managed to attend the prestigious writer's workshop at the University of Iowa. Her first novel, the autobiographical The House on Mango Street in 1984, huge commercial and critical success, earning her the American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation in 1985. I'm hoping that with your study of Tipiak that you'll want to turn and pick up the House on Mango Street uh, as, and read it as a compelling treatment of what it's like to be a Latina who lives and grows up in a all kinds of challenging situations and somehow finds her way to live the artist's life she'd always dreamed. Let's turn now to this uh, selection, Tipiak, and let's say one thing at level one just to set you up. This focuses, this short story focuses on a young girl's relationship with her grandfather, beginning on a single evening in her youth, moving ahead to a time when she returns to Tipiak as a woman after her grandfather's death, okay? In the end, Cisneros will abruptly punctuate her flowing style of writing with, notice this, short sentences emphasizing that the narrator realizes that no one remembers her childhood as she does. She is now the one responsible for that vanished world. Let's enjoy now the power of Cisneros' prose, all right, shall we? Let's go to work. When the sky of Tepeyac opens its first thin stars and the dark comes down in an ink of Japanese blue above the bell towers of La Basilica de Nuestra Señora. Above the plaza, photographers and their souvenir backdrops of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Above the balloon vendors and their balloons wearing paper hats. Above the red canopy thrones of the shoeshine stands. Above the wooden booths of the women frying lunch in vats of oil, above the tapaleria on the corner of Misterios and Cinco de Mayo, when the photographers have toted up their tripods and big box cameras, have rolled away the wooden ponies I don't know where, when the balloon men have sold all but the ugliest balloons and herded these last few home, when the shoeshine men have grown tired of squatting on their little wooden boxes, and the women frying lunch, have finished packing dishes, tablecloth pots in the big straw basket in which they came. Then, Abuelito tells the boy with dusty hair, Arturo, we are closed. And in crooked shoes and purple elbows, Arturo pulls down with a pole the corrugated metal curtains. First the one on Mysterios, then the other on Cinco de Mayo. Like an eyelid over each door, before Abuelito tells him he can go. This is when I arrive, one shoe and then the next, over the sagging doorstone, worn smooth in the middle from the warachis of those who have come for tins of glue and to have their scissors sharpened, who have asked for candles and cans of boot polish, a half kilo of nails, turpentine, blue-specked spoons, paintbrushes, 
photographic paper, a spool of picture wire, lamp oil, and string. Abuelito, under a bulb, light bulb, under a ceiling dusty with flies, puffs his cigar and counts money soft and wrinkled as old Kleenex, money earned by the plaza women serving lunch on flat tin plates, by the souvenir photographers and their canvas Recuerdo de Tepeyac backdrops, by the shoeshine men sheltered beneath their fringed and canopied kingdoms, by the blessed vendors of the holy cards, rosaries, scapulars, little plastic altars, by the good sisters who live in the convent across the street, counts and recounts in a whisper and puts the money in a paper sack we carry home. I take Apolito's hand, fat and dimpled in the center like a valentine, and we walk past the basilica where each Sunday the abuela lights the candles for the soul of Abuelito. Past the very same spot where long ago Juan Diego brought down from the Cerro the miracle that has drawn everyone except my Abuelito. On their knees, down the avenue one block past the bright lights of the Sastreria of Senor Guzman, who is still at work at his sewing machine, past the candy store where I buy my milk and raisin gelatins, past La Providencia Tortilleria, where every afternoon Luz Maria and I are sent for the basket of lunchtime tortillas, past the house of the widow Marquez, whose husband died last winter, of a tumor the size of her little white fist, past La Muñeca's mother, watering her famous dahlias with a pink rubber hose and a skinny string of water, to the house on La Fortuna, number 12, that has always been our house. Green iron gates that arabesque and scroll like the initials of my name. Familiar wine and clang, familiar lacework of ivy growing over and between, except for one small clean square for the hand of the postman, whose face I have never seen. Up the 22 steps we count out loud together. Uno, dos, tres, to the supper of Sopa de Fideo, and carne guisada, cuatro cinco seis. The glass of café con leche, siete ocho nueve. Shut the door against the mad parrot voice of the abuela. Diez, once, doce. Fall asleep as we always do with the television mumbling. Trece, catorce, quince. The abuelito snoring. Dieciséis, diecisiete, dieciocho. The grandchild, the one who will leave soon for that borrowed country. Page 106. Diecinueve, vente, vente uno. The one he will not remember, the one he is least familiar with. Vente dos, vente tres, vente cuatro. Years later, when the house on La Fortuna, number 12, is sold. When the tapaleria, corner of Mysterios and Cinco de Mayo, changes owners when the courtyard gate of arabesques and scrolls is taken off its hinges and replaced with a corrugated sheet metal door instead, when the Buddha Marquez and La Muñeca's mother move away, when Abuelito falls asleep one last time, 25, 26, 27, years afterward, when I return to the shop on the corner of Mysterios and Cinco de Mayo, repainted and redone as a pharmacy, to the basilica that is crumbling and closed, to the plaza photographers, the balloon vendors, and shoeshine thrones, the women whose faces I do not recognize serving lunch in the wooden booths, to the house on La Fortuna, number 12, smaller and darker than when we lived there, with the rooms boarded shut and rented to strangers, the street suddenly dizzy with automobiles and diesel fumes, the house fronts scuffed and the gardens frayed, the children who played kickball, all grown and moved away. Who would have guessed, after all this time, it is me who will remember when everything else is forgotten, you who took with you to your stone bed something irretrievable without a name. Now let's go ahead and just say it out loud at 2B right away. Many argue that this passage is as much poetry as it is prose. It has this beautiful melodic tendency to it. Let's pay attention really quickly, first of all, just at level one. What is this passage actually about, this short story? 
Well, obviously it's about the passage of time. Namely, of course, recognizing that this is the essence of what it's like to grow older. As sophomores, we're already beginning to get a sense of that, aren't we? That as we're getting older, so are the people in our lives who for all of our youth were old. And then someday those older people will most likely be passed. And we will have to remember them and who they were and what they were, primarily through the experience of, of course, trying to place in our mind's eye the setting where they were. So notice that we've got the setting here as central to this beautifully constructed little story. Notice at 2A that we're talking about the value of the aged, the value of the old in our lives, and the ways in which they give to us things that we don't normally fully appreciate until when? Unfortunately, long after the fact, when, of course, many times, tragically, sadly, they're gone. And then we kind of remember, oh yeah, that's right. Here, notice, it is the grandfather. The grandfather who's, of course, somehow a stable part of the community, and of course, the child who recognizes all of that. Let's jump to 2B really quickly and point out how Cisneros very brilliantly uses repetition for her style. Did you notice this? Notice, for example, in the opening on page 104, in the opening paragraph, it's above the balloon vendors, above, above the wooden boots. Then it's the word when repeated over and over again, when, when. Then on page 105, notice first full paragraph, it's under, under, and then it's by, by, by. Then it's past, past, past. Do you see this? These repetitions of these words. What is going on there? Jot it down in 2B for you. What is it that's going on with these repetitions of these words? Many have pointed out that reading this passage then is like the passage of time. It's literally like walking past and through all of the memories that are simply the town, that is to say, Tibiak itself, right? Culminating, of course, then, with powerful symbolism at the very end, when we realize that this is what modernity is, that is to say, the overcoming of the old to kind of give us the new. Notice again the last, then, line, paragraph on page 106. Who would have guessed, after all this time, it is me who will remember when everything else is forgotten, you who took with you to your stone bed something irretrievable, without a name. What is it that made her, the grandfather, so vital, so important? The answer here is something irretrievable, something mysterious, something enigmatic, something beyond expression. And yet, this is the power of the aged, of the old for us. The celebration of the old, of course, a major message at 2A, the passage of time, the power of modernity to kind of overtake uh, the past, the old. The old is, re is replaced by the new. It's, of course, difficult for us when we're young to appreciate that someday we will be the old and our grandson or granddaughter will look at us and say, back in, back in the dark ages when you lived, and then they'll start saying things like, you carried around a phone in your hand? You actually had to talk into the phone? This is amazing. Like, what was that like way back then? It's kind of a mind screw for us to think that the, this is coming for us. This is the inevitability. Let's jump to 3A really quickly. What is the text for you that celebrates grandfathers? You'll maybe remember grandparents in general, grandfathers, grandmothers, the aged, the old. You'll maybe remember that as a fr in our freshman year, we studied a, a text called The Celebration of Grandfathers that actually argued that it's the old that have to show the way to the young. And the young have to learn from the old and respect the old and remember the old. What is the text for you that makes that argument most powerfully? What is the film for you? where the young learn something from the old. And it might have started out in that text so that the young didn't think that there was anything he or she had to learn from the older, and then the older, in fact, teaches something profoundly important. What's the text for you that it's only after the fact that the young then realizes the value of the old? Maybe kind of sadly, too late. Finally, at 3B, just for a few moments, consider the passage of time. 
How has even your world changed since you began school in kindergarten, for example, now that you are a sophomore? How has modernity changed your life? That, of course, piece of technology that we call that smartphone is but one example of many of the ways in which technology is changing, radically changing the way in which you experience the world. Talk to anybody about music from the old days and they will tell you that back in the old days, you had to go to a store and you had to buy this vinyl disc that you literally put on a turntable and you picked up the arm that had a little needle on it and you set it on top of the record, the vinyl that turned, and the music came out. Of course, for us today, we just simply have the access to music immediately, right? It, the way in which, even in the music world, we can see the world is changing quite, quite radically. Finally, at 3B, what, who is the person in your life that best represents the old ways, but the ways that still need to be held on to? It may be somebody who you still have with you. It may be somebody that you had with you who has now passed. If you have someone in your life who is old, who is still alive, this text suggests treasure that person or those people. Understand them through their eyes, not through your eyes, and make sure that you show proper respect. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed both of these. Let's finish, though, with 3A really quickly by just making a quick comparative observation. How does the Hughes piece and the Cisneros piece for you work together, right? I mean, they're both obviously celebrating important individuals, aren't they? How are they different for you? In what ways are they different? Stylistically, how do these two work? The power of repetition for Cisneros, the power of simple language for Hughes. Let's uh, begin to pay attention in our reading to these comparisons between these titles. It is, of course, compelling. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, both of these titles. Thank you.